Wednesday morning and our Wednesday night Bible studies on the same track because I was able to finish last week's lesson with the Wednesday morning group, was not able to get it finished with our Sunday night group, and I really don't want the two being on two different two different studies. So tonight, I'm going to finish the lesson on Jephthah on a note taker. I'm just going to go do a very, very detailed note taker on what I would have said. Tonight, we'll go ahead and continue with Samson. So we'll pick up with Samson tonight. So go ahead and start reading those first couple of chapters in the book of Judges on Samson, please. And for you Wednesday night people, I'll give you a detailed note taker finishing everything up that I would have would have said. I love John chapter 6. I I like John chapter 6 especially because we have one of the greatest miracles in the New Testament. In fact, outside of the resurrection itself, this is the only miracle that is recorded by all four gospel writers. Outside of the resurrection, this was the miracle. The one miracle that all of them had to talk about. This this one, in their opinion, was for the record books. This one was the one that was worth repeating. And as we go through the book of John, we know that Jesus had been teaching, He had been performing miracles, and the crowds were amazed by what He had been doing. Their minds were blown at the miracles that He had been performing. So the crowds were following Him everywhere. Well, this was zapping Jesus' energy. Jesus needed some rest. So what He did is He crossed the Sea of Galilee and the crowds followed Him. And then we read there in verse 3 of John chapter 6, after He crossed the Sea of Galilee, it said, Jesus went up on a mountainside and He sat down with His disciples. Notice what the crowds do there in verse 5. When Jesus looked up, He saw a great crowd coming towards Him. So they were still following Him. He said to Philip, Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now let's stop for a second. It is no accident that Jesus asked Philip about the availability of supplies. You see, the miracle occurs really close to Philip's hometown. So if anybody would know where to go and get the supplies that they needed to feed this crowd, it would have been Philip. Now, this takes us to lesson number one. Lesson number one on your note taker. Folks, whenever God presents us with a challenge, we need to realize that something's up. Whenever God presents us with a challenge, we need to realize that something's up. Think about this. Philip and the other disciples, they found themselves in an impossible situation. The crowds had grown and grown. They had grown to number in the thousands. And in this particular story, it's getting really late. And the later it gets, the more hungry that the people get. So he singles uh, Philip out. Philip again is a local boy. And so Jesus asked Philip, Philip, where can we go and buy some food to feed this crowd? Now I love Philip's response because Philip answers Jesus. Philip responds to Jesus the way that every one of us would respond to Jesus. Look at verse 7 right there. Philip answered him, Lord, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a single bite. Listen to what Philip is saying there. Philip is saying, Lord, it would take a hard-working man eight long months to earn enough money just to give each one of these people a single solitary bite. So Philip is telling the Lord here, Lord, we can't afford it. Uh, Jesus, we don't have that kind of money, and Jesus, we can't get that kind of money. I'm sure way back in Philip's mind, he is thinking to himself, why is he asking me to do this? Why is Jesus putting me on the spot? Well, don't miss John's little insertion there. In verse 6, look at it. He asked this, that's Jesus, Jesus asked this only to test him, that's Philip, for he, Jesus, already had in mind what he was going to do. Now, 
This raises a couple of very important questions for us. I mean, Lord, if you already know what you're going to do, why ask us about it? Uh, if God already knows what He's going to do, why doesn't He just go ahead and do it? If God already knows what He's going to do, it, why should we worry about it? Why should we even pray about it? Well, sometimes, brothers and sisters, the answer is lesson number two today. When God presents us with a challenge, God will often do so in order to test us. God wants to know, are we willing to put feet to our faith? Are we just uh, are we walking the walk? Or are we really talking the talk? Jesus was going to show here, Jesus was going to reveal in Philip's life whether all of the sermons that Jesus had been preaching really stuck. Jesus was going to show here whether or not all of the miracles that Philip had been witnessing had really deepened his faith. Or was Philip one of those people that was just amazed by the sideshow? Well, Philip takes the test. Philip does the test like most of us would have done the test. When he is confronted with the multitude, Philip kind of pulls out his oversized Texas Instruments scientific calculator and old Philip starts figuring. So what Philip does is he, he punches in the size of the crowd and he multiplies that by about how much each one of those people would eat and then he subtracts that from the bankroll that is in Judas's purse. He hits equal and he realizes, Lord, we're in the red. There is no way we've got enough money to give these people just a few appetizers. You see, Philip figures out that the size of the challenge versus the quantity of the resources, they just don't add up. And what Philip mistakenly does here is he does what we as humans do when God presents us with challenges is that we try to use human logic to figure out heavenly operations. So Philip concluded, Lord, we don't have enough. You know, folks, you don't have to be spiritual to declare it can't be done. You don't have to have an ounce of faith in your body to always focus on the negatives. And there is something in the story that never occurred to Philip. It never occurred to this disciple that even though the crowds were huge and the situation looked bleak, that Jesus was in the midst. The multitudes may have been large, the need may have been great. The resources may have been zero. But Jesus was in the midst. Sure, they didn't have stores. Sure, they didn't have the money even if they had had stores. What they did have, however, was Jesus the Christ right there with them. You see, church, lesson number three today, any challenge that God presents to us is always small in comparison to God Himself. You all see this? Folks, any challenge that comes our way, we need to leave here today knowing this. Any, any, there is no fine print to this. Any challenge that comes our way is always small when you compare it to the presence of God Himself. And I don't care what you wake up facing. I don't care what the phone call brings when you answer it. I don't care what the email says when you read it. I don't care what the mail carrier brings you. Whatever negative stuff, heavy stuff, difficult stuff that you find yourself challenged with, it is always small in comparison to God Himself. You see, some of y'all here today, let's tell the truth and shame the devil. Some of y'all here today, you're surrounded by a meager financial outlook, but you're forgetting the Lord. Some of you are consumed by headache and heartache in your family, and you're forgetting the Lord. 
Some of you are saturated with helplessness and hopelessness. You're staying awake at night. You're wringing your hands. You're wiping the sweat off of your brow because you just don't know. But what you are doing, my friend, is you are forgetting the Lord. Maybe you're not seeing a way out. Maybe you can't fathom how there could be any help or hope on the horizon. You don't know how positive can come out of the negative. My friend, you may not know that, but God does. Our challenges are always smaller than God Himself. Read this with me. Our challenges are always smaller than God Himself. Now, notice here. While Jesus was challenging Philip and Philip was holding his, his scientific calculator, Andrew, Andrew went out into the crowd just to see what was out there. Now, remember, we're talking 5,000 men. You bring women and children into the equation, there's easily 20, 25,000 people here. We're talking major challenge. And Andrew's out roaming the crowd and he finds one thing relating to food. And that's a little boy with his lunch. Look at verse 9 there in your scriptures. He says, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but, but how far will they go among so many? Andrew, isn't he? Andrew's on the same wavelength as Philip. Lord, all we've got is this little boy's lunch. What is five loaves and two fish going to do to feed 25,000 people? Folks, you can't slice them that thin. <laughs> this is not going to happen. Andrew, Andrew looked at the little that he had and he disregarded it because it didn't make any sense to human logic. In Andrew's eyes, the little he had couldn't possibly meet the need that they faced. Now, I think this is important. Lesson number four. Folks, in meeting the challenges that is set before us, Jesus wants us to always start with what we've got. Come on, do your head like this. Right? Jesus always wants us to start with what we've got, where we are at. The, the reason I think so many of us fail the challenges that is put with us is we don't recognize the resources that God has already given us. Like Andrew, we profess, but Lord, the task is so big and my resources are so small. <laughs> I was thinking this week about this passage. I'm going to date myself a little bit. Let's go back to the 80s for a second. Some of y'all can fall asleep on this a little bit. The rest of y'all, let's go back to the 80s. Do y'all remember the garbage bag, the hefty garbage bag commercials back in the 80s? Remember you had the hefty, and so that they would do a comparison and contrast between two garbage bags, and you'd have one over here that wouldn't hold much, and the stuff that you put in, it would always break, and the garbage bag would kind of talk. I know it sounds crazy, great commercials. And the, 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 the opponent's garbage bag would always be like, I'm going to have to raise my voice here and embarrass myself. You know, be like, whippy, whippy, whippy. You know, and then you'd have the hefty. Y'all remember this? You have the hefty garbage bags over here and they'd be like, hefty, hefty, hefty. And it'd be like, whippy, whippy, whippy. Hefty, hefty, hefty. And the whole point was, was that the hefty garbage bags could hold, could handle whatever you brought it. You see, Andrew and Philip, they're over here holding the wimpy garbage bag. They're holding the wimpy lunch. They're saying, this is all we've got and it's wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. And they're looking at 25,000 people and they're thinking, man, to feed all those, that is hefty, hefty, hefty. And they're looking at what they've got. They're looking at what they need. They're looking at what they've got. They're looking at what they need. And the whole time, Jesus is standing right here. He's going, come on, boys. Come on, right here. Look at me. Look at me. Don't forget me, Jesus said. You know elsewhere in the sermon, Jesus said over in Mark chapter 4, He says, what should we say the kingdom of God is like? What parable should we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, wimpy, 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 
which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can purge in its shade. What is Jesus' point there? He is saying even the most meager situations mixed with faith can produce profound results. <laughs> Glory. Just, just how meager was the situation. Well, well, let's look at it for a second, shall we? Well, let's look at the boy of the lunch. First of all, folks, he was insignificant. Uh, none of the gospel writers give us his name. If he was important, we'd have known his name. But he's only one in a multitude of 25,000. I imagine this boy, this is purely, purely my speculation. I imagine this boy's about nine or ten years old. And two, he was very, very poor. Well, now, preacher, how do you know that this little boy was poor? Well, folks, he had barley loaves. Barley loaves was poor man's bread. It's like saltine crackers. The, the fish, this wasn't fish. <laughs> this was fish. He had some sardines is what he had. So what do we got here? We got probably a preteen boy with sardines and crackers. That's the lunch that he had for himself. So we've got an insignificant boy with an insignificant lunch. But this no-name boy with an off-brand lunch is more than enough for Jesus the Christ. Uh, look at verse 10. Uh, Jesus said, I think we miss this statement in the story, by the way. Look at verse 10 right there. Jesus said, have the people, you can say it, what have the people sit down. This is one of the most important phrases in this entire story. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying, fellas, position the people for a miracle. Now, now watch this, pay, pay attention here. When Jesus says, have the people sit down, He's really saying to them, get them ready for me to do something big. Now, they don't know what Jesus is going to do, but Jesus knows what He's going to do. Now, now I want you to notice the most important phrase in this story. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 tells us that Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks. Jesus took the loaves and what? Gave thanks. So important, I'm going to say it one more time. Jesus took the loaves and He gave thanks. For barley loaves, poor man's bread, sardines and crackers. Jesus took them and He gave thanks. Y'all ready for lesson number five? Come on now, you sure? You want to go to lesson number five? Okay. Let's go to lesson number five. Friends, don't ever expect to God, don't ever expect God to bless us with more until we offer praise and thanksgiving for what we've already got. We have to start with what we've got. <laughs> Andrew took the loaves and said, this isn't going to do anything. Jesus took the same loaves and said, hey, let's have praise and thanksgiving. Jesus gave thanks for the little He had. He wasn't like most of us that complain that we don't have more. Jesus stopped here and said, Lord, even though what I have is not enough for what I need, I'm still going to praise You for what I have. Jesus stops here and says, I'm going to give you thanks, Lord, for the not enough stuff. Lord, even though the outgo is more than the income, I'm still going to spend my time in gratitude. And folks, we can pray, Lord, I'd rather have pot roast and potatoes, but all I've got are hot dogs and baked beans, and instead of complaining, I'm going to offer thanksgiving for what I do have. Folks, Jesus stopped here and offered thanks for practically nothing. But when you take nothing and put it in the hands of God, when you take that which is little and put it in the hands of God, when you take the insignificant and you bless it and dedicate it and offer gratitude for it, you are positioning yourself for God to do something great. 
Now notice what happens next. Verse 11. <clears throat> Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated. Now it's tempting to pass over this point. Have you ever noticed this in this story? Come on now, look at your Bibles. John says, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to whom? Oh, have you, you ever noticed that before? Have you ever seen that before? He didn't say Jesus gave the food out to those who were there, does He? Do you hear like this? No. That's not what John says. He says he gave the food out to those who believed him enough to do what? To sit down. You know, there's naysayers in every crowd. <laughs> I'm sure some laughed. I'm sure some scoffed. Oh, did you hear? <laughs> he thinks he's going to feed all of us with sardines and crackers. This is ridiculous foolishness, I tell you. I want no part of this. You kind of hear the people, kind of like those two men on the Muppet show, remember them? They always sit up in the balcony grumbling about everything. You know, that's kind of what you hear the naysayers in the crowd here. They say, look at all those fools are sitting down. Oh, well, the joke's on them. They're not going to have enough food to eat. But folks, Jesus distributed to those who believed Him enough to sit down. And if you were not seated, you didn't eat that day. Lesson number six. Folks, God will never do amazing things in our life until we have the faith to position ourselves for Him to do great things in our lives. Some of you haven't seen God come through because you're spending all your time complaining about what you don't have rather than giving thanks for what you do have. And church, let me tell you, God hates a complainer. Church, God is offended. When we spend our time griping about what He has not done instead of celebrating what He has done. And if all that God has given you is sardines and crackers, you need to start pouring out the praise. If all you are eating is bologna sandwiches, you need to start pouring out the gratitude. The problem is we want to focus more on the meagerness of our resources than on the power of God itself. But the Bible, church, the Bible is full of examples of God always using the insignificant. When God wanted to form man, the crown of His creation, He found Himself some dirt. And God used insignificant dirt to make His most astounding creation. The clothes you're wearing, the clothes that are covering you, is nothing but dirt. Everyone sitting in this room is nothing but a big pile of dirt. Now granted, Mary Kay has shown you how you can make dirt look a whole lot better. <laughs> but we're still dirt. We may be dirt, but friends, we're dirt in the hands of God. God took the shepherd's staff of Moses and used it to part the Red Sea because God delights and using the insignificant. God took the jawbone of a donkey and gave it to Samson so he could slay 1,000 Philistines because God loves using the insignificant. God took the slingshot and put it in the hands of a teenager in order to slay a giant because God gets a thrill when He can use the insignificant. And God took a lunch of sardines and crackers and put them in the hands of the disciples and fed 25,000 people because God enjoys it when He can use the insignificant. We got a no-name boy with an off-brand lunch who was willing to hand his poverty over to Jesus. Now that's not how we think, is it? Come on, let's get personal, shall we? We think, this is all I have. <laughs> it's bad enough that all I have is sardines and crackers. And Jesus wants that too? Really? Lesson number seven. In order to position ourselves for a miracle, for God to do something big in our lives, we must hand over whatever we've got to Jesus the Christ. This little boy helped promote a miracle because he was willing to take a risk. 
Folks, handed over his lunch was a really big risk. His mama prepared him that lunch and he was hungry. His mama did not prepare that lunch for 25,000 people. That was his lunch. And Jesus was saying to the boy, Son, will you hand over the little that you have? The boy was willing and Jesus did something amazing. Look at verse 12 there. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. The insignificant in the hands of Christ became more than enough. Some of y'all don't realize that just by you showing up every single Sunday, just by you being faithful to the assembly of the Lord's people, it may not seem like much. You think, I just show up and I just sit here and I listen. But you don't realize, my friends, that God will take your faithfulness of just showing up, of honoring the assembly of God's people. And God will do amazing things from you just coming here and being a part of this assembly. You will encourage somebody. You will encourage the speaker. You, God will do things in your life that you have no clue about. You think it's just sardines and crackers. But God will feed 25,000 people with it. You may think, you say, you know what? There's people in my work, they need to know Jesus, they love Jesus, but I, I, you just, I'm so scared, I feel like I don't know my Bible enough, Talk, talking to them about Jesus, I just don't know. Friends, you don't know how just the simple act of being a productive, faithful employee, being the best employee that you possibly can be, how God will take your faithfulness in that situation and do incredibly things with it and turn you into a powerful witness. Some of you may think, I don't have much to give to the Lord. My income is so insignificant. But God will take the little that you have and the little that you give and do incredibly things for incredible things for the kingdom of God through this church. Some of you may think, "Can I'm just so scared?" I need a relationship with the Lord. I want a better relationship with the Lord. But I'm just scared to step out in front of a crowd. I'm scared to do this. I'm scared to do that. But my friends, God will take your fear if you'll hand it over to Him and turn it into something incredible. So I'm going to pray while we're singing our invitation song that the Holy Spirit would identify in your life the things that you think are insignificant, your sardines and crackers that you think that Jesus could never use, that the Holy Spirit would bring that to your mind and you would surrender those things today. Some of you, that's your life. Some of you, that's coming to Jesus for the very first time in confession and repentance. It's being baptized for the remission of your sins. Some of you, that's where you need to start. That is your starting point. Let's stand, please, would you? And we're going to sing two stanzas, Glenda, of Just As I Am, first and last, friends. Raise your hand, man. I'll come to you. You don't have to come up here. I will come back there.